Hello, and welcome to New Findings and Policies to Advance Healthy Latino Communities. My name is Star Tiffany, and along with my colleague, Joanna Hathaway, we will be running today's web forum. If you experience technical difficulties during this WebEx session, please dial 1-866-229-3239 for assistance. This number is also on the screen, and you may want to write that number down for future reference. The audio portion of the web form can be heard through your computer speakers or a headset plugged into your computer. If at any time you are having technical difficulties regarding audio, please send a question in the Q&A panel, and Joanna or I will provide the teleconference information to you. Once the web form ends today, a survey evaluation will open in a new window. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation as we need your feedback to improve our web form. We are encouraging you to ask questions throughout today's presentation. To do so, simply click the question mark icon, type your question in, and hit send. Please send your question to all panelists. We will be addressing questions both throughout and at the end of the presentation. We will be using the polling feature to get your feedback during the event. The first poll is on screen now. Oh, sorry. Please select your answer from the available choices and click the Submit button. Um, we would just like to find out if you're attending the web forum individually, in a group of two to five people, in a group of six to ten people, or in a group of more than ten people. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the day, Dr. George Flores. Dr. Flores is a program manager for the California Endowment's Healthy California Prevention Team. His work focuses on grant making to improve health and equity through community-based prevention and a health workforce for 21st century health system reform. His work aims to strengthen the public health system, primary care, and community outreach, along with cross-sector collaboration to address the social and environmental factors that shape health outcomes. Dr. Flores was recognized by the National Hispanic Medical Association as 2011 Physician of the Year for his work that addresses social and environmental inequities and the role of communities in advancing policy and systems change to improve health. His vision is for every community to be a healthy, safe, and supportive place to raise children, go to school, work, and play. Dr. Flores, please go ahead. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this great web forum. I'm uh, really pleased to introduce you that you haven't participated previously in a dialogue for health for this format. It's our opportunity for learning and also for giving input. The poll question that Star introduced is just the first example of uh, questions that we're going to have a series of here in between our speakers. And I'd also uh, like to thank all of you for taking your time to uh, meet with us and our presenters today. I think that, that you'll be very, very excited about the presentations. We're uh, striving to provide new information that is useful to you in your practice and in your community. So uh, our intention is really to share with you uh, good information that is useful and then we ask for your feedback at the end of this uh, of this webinar uh, in terms of, a, of a, an evaluation form so that you could let us know if we did our job and it's really if this has benefited you. So um, please uh, give, our, give your greatest attention to our presenters today. And the topic that we have has to do with obesity prevention for the Latino population. Uh, our examples are mainly drawn from California, although they're certainly relevant across the United States. And this builds on a prior web forum that we uh, conducted a couple of months ago with Dialogue for Health um, uh, regarding weight of the nation for Latino children. And we held that in both Spanish and English. It was the first time a national web forum like this was held in both languages, and we had uh, several hundred people uh, turn up for that web forum and give us great feedback, uh, and uh, we really enjoyed uh, uh, having both the audience participation 
as well as the learning that we got from that occasion. Uh, so this is our second in in terms of building on the topic of Latino obesity prevention, uh, and we want to share uh, information with you today that's timely and we think will be of use to you uh, in your, your future work in this arena. Um, our objectives for this web forum is to understand the evidence of how childhood obesity impacts Latinos, and Dr. Uh, uh, Ramirez will be giving you a lot of data and, and talk about research uh, that is building that evidence base, and then learning about how Latino communities are addressing uh, the problem of childhood obesity with policy and environmental change. And uh, Mr. Quintero and uh, Robert Garcia will also be speaking to that issue. Um, so, uh, with uh, our uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce you at least to uh, Emily's uh, uh, and Andre and Robert's uh, pictures. Uh, Robert likes to wear funny hats, as you can notice, and uh, uh, we'll uh, be presenting them one by one right after we do this poll. Um, so this is your second opportunity to answer questions, and please draw your attention uh, to the to the poll questions as they will come up, uh, and we'd like you to to answer this question: To which of the following do you attribute the recently reported leveling off of obesity rates among Latinos? And check all of the different uh, boxes that you think are, are uh, reasons why that leveling off is occurring: healthier food uh, uh, and beverages in schools, improved school physical education, neighborhood improvements for safe walking and biking, more parks and places to play, increased public awareness in general about obesity, food industry providing healthier choices, medical attention, increased breastfeeding, or other. Uh, so um, please uh, mark your questions in the poll box to the lower right-hand uh, portion of your, your screen. Uh, and uh, then click that submit box down at the bottom. You must also click submit in order for us to receive your, your answers. Uh, and then um, also I want to draw your attention to another feature, uh, and that is the opportunity to submit questions. So you'll see in the lower uh, portion of your screen there a box that says a question mark Q&A, and then you can ask panelists, and that's where you type in your question and then push send so that we can receive your questions and uh, we'll answer them um, according to relevance in, in the speaker. And uh, some questions we might answer right after the speaker. If we have a limited amount of time to do that. But we expect to have plenty of time after all three uh, speakers have presented their information um, because uh, this session is to be 90 minutes and uh, our, our speakers are going to speak for uh, quite a bit less than that. So we'll have plenty of time to receive your questions and answer them and, and discuss them. So please submit questions. We're very interested in what you think. Uh, even if they aren't questions, if they're observations, we'd be pleased to see that as well. We'd like this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Emily Ramirez. Uh, she's Director of the Institute for Health Promotion Research at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. Emily is an internationally recognized cancer and chronic disease health disparities researcher, professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at the UT Health Sciences Center, where she's also founding director of the Institute for Health Promotion Research, which researches health disparities among minorities. Over the past 30 years, Dr. Ramirez has directed many research programs focused on human and organizational communication to reduce chronic disease and cancer health disparities affecting Latinos, including cancer risk factors, clinical trial recruitment, tobacco prevention, uh, obesity prevention, and more. Uh, she is the director of Salud America, which is a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded uh, uh, project, a national project. And uh, uh, Amelie, I'm turning it over to you now. And um, I can't, um, oops, I'm having a little difficulty with my slides. Can, can you hear me? 
Hi, Dr. Ramirez. Yes. What, Hi. Did, are uh, you just you're on slide two? Uh, yeah. I wanted to go back to slide one. So just take your mouse and click in the middle of the slide. Okay. And then change to the arrows on your keyboard. There we you go. Should be able okay. To. Okay. Great. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Okay. Thank you very much for the technical assistance, and I apologize, uh, George. Um, thank you so much for today. It's really exciting to, to be here with all of you and with the other panelists. I wanted to give you uh, just a brief overview of some of the things that we're seeing in Latino childhood obesity. And we've um, been very fortunate to be funded by the uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, over the last uh, six years to uh, establish a Latino-based uh, research network looking at these um, particular issues. Um, we, most of you know that right now with our Latino boys, um, they've had some of the highest rates of uh, obesity uh, or, or an overweight or obesity than other um, non-Hispanic white uh, ch children. Uh, and it's now beginning to, look like it's beginning to taper just a tad. And we're also seeing the same thing uh, with girls, but their rates were not as high as we saw for, for African American uh, girls. And, so what, we, what we're seeing now is that um, for the first time in 30 years, you know, we're, we're holding kind of steady in terms of the obesity rates, but I think we need to be careful and cautious with that. We really need to learn about what's, what's helping us uh, reverse the tide here and that we need to maintain that momentum and keep it going because right now it's just been a slight increase. Um, the CDC report, you know, uh, mentioned that uh, they saw a slight decline also in lower income and preschool children's obesity rates, but still one in six Latino children between the ages of two and five uh, remain obese, and so we really need to, to look at that. I, I work with physicians who are already seeing fatty livers in our young uh, children, uh, you know, as young as six years of age, so this is still a critical issue. And then here in San Antonio, um, I'm based at the University of Texas Health Science Center, and San Antonio actually reported a drop in, in obesity rates, and I work very closely with our Metropolitan Health District. And we're also cautious about uh, this drop. We're excited to see it. We have a very active Mayor's Fitness Council, and we had uh, one of CDC's um, Put Prevention into Practice grants that has really helped us push the city forward because we were known as being one of the, the heaviest cities, so we're glad to see this drop. But as you well know, these um, assessments are done in different cohorts of studies, so it's not necessarily, you know, a match to match. So we just need to um, continue to see if year after year we see these particular trends um, continuing. So we hope that the drop continues. Um, and then another study uh, done by the University of Michigan showed that um, Hispanic adult rates, um, they finally, uh, Hispanic adults finally acknowledged that childhood obesity was a top concern for them. So we're getting the attention of parents to focus more um, on this issue. We know that our foods and our culture uh, really promote um, showing our love through food, uh, and so it's really hard to change some of those behaviors, and many times our families for the first time have income to take their children out to, for, uh, to restaurants and so forth, but, uh, but we're promoting perhaps um, eating habits that are not the most appropriate and getting them to go back to cooking at home and eating at home as a family is, is really critical. So I wanted to share with you one of the first things we did when we were funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation was to establish a Latino-based uh, research network that was interested in looking at reversing the trend in Latino childhood obesity. I have prior experience in developing a Hispanic-based uh, research network for cancer, so we applied a lot of what we learned um, through um, that mechanism to our new mechanism on childhood obesity. and. Um, we, we were able to do a, a Delphi study that we involved the community to share with us what they thought was the most important things that we should address as a community to, to reverse Latino childhood obesity. And what the community told us through our opinion um, survey was that we should focus on family, schools, and community. And therefore, uh, with the resources provided by the, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we were able to award 20 pilot projects that um, in, in 11 different states that were tackling issues related to these three areas. And so our main mission was to, to get researchers involved in looking at Latino childhood obesity and to also increasing awareness in our community about solutions that were available. Um, and now, um, so that, and we've, our network is composed of over 2,100 20, leaders. 
uh, from throughout the U.S. that are following our work. We have a very active website, so we encourage you, if you haven't been there, to go to saludamerica.org. And uh, we also have a very active social uh, media campaign. During um, the, the initial period of uh, our grantees, as I mentioned, we funded 20 pilot projects. Uh, we worked with the American Journal of Preventive Medicine to develop a supplement to highlight the research that was going on in Latino communities. Um, this is an example of one of our researchers, Dr. Rebecca London. She was looking at after-school play for children, and she found that uh, Latino kids in after-school fitness programs had a 10% increased probability of being more fit after after two years. In another program, we had Dr. Van Gao, who looked at the utilization of video games in after-school programs. And he also found that these video games after school could increase physical endurance among our Hispanic kids. And also, uh, they had a, um, uh, an academic benefit in terms of having higher math scores, and they had higher performance in running a one-mile event. And in terms of policy changes, because we were interested not only at community level change, but what else could we do? We, uh, one of our researchers, Dr. Nelda Mier from Texas A&M the, along the lower Rio Grande Valley in Texas, um, she documented that a lot of our regions that is, um, has large colonias and so forth, that people weren't going outside to try to do exercise because of the, the trash that they found in the poor environment in their regions. So she got the community involved. They presented their findings to the local um, developers, and they were able to get a new developer to come in and, uh, and share these results with them. And therefore, as they were building new high, um, housing, they are more likely to put in a hike and bike trails and have a recreation and outdoor exercise area that the community could utilize. So it was a tremendous change for, for that community. In another study uh, in uh, New Brunswick, uh, Connecticut, Dr. Dudley um, involved teens in a photo voice project in which he got them to document um, similar types of things, you know, showing open trash bins, broken sidewalks, empty pools where kids couldn't come and utilize some of the resources that were in the community. And they shared those results with their city council. Uh, and they also talked about not having enough physical activity um, opportunities in their high school, so they wanted to see if they could get an after school uh, PE credit recovery program, and so they were able to work with their local Y to make this hap um, ha be able to happen. They arranged busing so that the students, um, Latino students, could go to the Y and get this extra credit. Um, so they were able to do an, a number of things, and they have been able to sustain the program over time. In another project, our own uh, Dr. Carmen Nevarez uh, from uh, PHI, um, she focused on looking at menu labeling in small Latino restaurants in the Los Angeles area, and she also found a tremendous benefit, and she was able to uh, put the calorie counts uh, and um, in the different menus and that people were looking at that um, more significantly than those uh, restaurants that did not have um, um, calorie counts. And she also developed a toolkit that is now online that other restaurant owners can have access to to replicate this uh, menu labeling program. And then on our phase two is slightly different. We realize that we need to um, create more change in our, uh, in our community and provide them with more community development uh, opportunities. So we are um, developing a new program, and the mission here is to develop a community capacity to create uh, change for, the, for Latino health uh, and being prepared not only for obesity but other uh, chronic diseases that we need to be uh, encountering. So this is for the next two years we're really uh, emphasizing uh, this area. And we're building, in this phase, uh, second phase, we're building evidence for community change. Uh, we've developed six new uh, research packages, uh, videos, and infographics that deal with um, getting a healthier food uh, uh, snacks in our Latino schools, in our schools that are, um, are heavily populated by the Latino community. We want uh, also to change our Latino communities to offer better foods in their neighborhood and their, their corner grocery stores. We want our communities to have better active places, more parks, more uh, recreational areas, and that they can continue their af active play after school as well. And all of these um, new packages can be found on our website. And we've also just released a healthier marketing um, uh, research package that shows that over um, 
$2 billion is being spent on Hispanic food marketing, uh, and we, we need to really um, be aware that uh, where our children are being targeted. And the last one to come out later this month will be on sugary drinks and what communities can do with, with that. Um, again, uh, this is an example of what we're doing. Um, this is our infographic on active spaces for Latinos. We um, talk about why uh, we have, why there's a need, kind of what's the bad, uh, what's going on in our communities, and we talk about the good, some positive solutions and recommendations, um, good uh, things that are happening in local communities, and then providing some solid con conclusions that communities can take in trying to implement in their places, such as encouraging shared use agreements uh, or encouraging more complete streets, offering um, different types of uh, opportunities for communities to come together and, and exercise. Um, I was going to show you all a, a video, but you can find it on our Salute Today YouTube. Uh, each of these segments that I've just mentioned has a video component to go along with it so that you can use it in discussion groups in your community to, to get the discussion started. In addition, we're building a, a very active plat platform that we call Growing Healthy Change or Promoviendo Cambios Saludables um, to, to get our communities more informed. It's going to have this uh, interactive capabilities. Again, we're, we have all our current information on the six topics that I've just mentioned. But in addition, it's going to have the latest Latino obesity news and policies that communities can utilize. It will also have different types of resources that can help advance change. Instead of trying to rebuild something new, we're going to have some evidence-based programs there that individuals can, can review and, and tailor to their communities. And we also want to hear from the community. We want to make this interactive. We want to find out what's going on in your community that's positive. And so we hope that individuals will upload videos and picture, pictures or text to let us know how they're growing a healthy change in, in their community. And we're also going to make this geographic specific so you can you know log in by the, the city that you live in or the state that you live in and find out what's going on in those particular regions. In addition, the platform will also demonstrate how people can grow healthy changes in their own communities by uh, utilizing some of the tools and resources that we're providing, taking some of the training uh, modules that will be available, or by participating in webinars such as this one and others that we'll be offering uh, with PHI, and also um, continuing to look for role model videos and, and um, of individuals doing the right thing for their communities and making the, the right choice the easy choice. Um, so we're really excited about this new venture. We hope to be able to, to launch it in uh, 2014. And then just coming to an end, you know, it's, it's not all just about Latino childhood obesity, that those of us who work in Latino communities, we really need to remember that we need to educate. Our communities need a lot of information to motivate them for change um, in, in different areas of health uh, and specifically in the topic that we're dealing with today. We need to continue to learn more about how to best reach our communities. We haven't really resolved that issue. And we're told here in San Antonio is the, the is what the future is going to look like, what Texas will look like in 20 years, and what the U.S. will look like in another 40 years. And so we really need to be prepared to how to better um, provide the resources that our community needs. We need to continue training uh, in, in higher education for our communities, uh, getting people involved in, in research and, and other types of activities. And you know, as they come in contact with the public health care systems, we need to make sure that we're being as culturally sensitive to our patients uh, as we can. Uh, so these, these things are extremely um, critical. Um, so again, I, I want to just thank um, George and the team for uh, giving me this opportunity to address you all today. So, Amelie, thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you can all draw your attention to these poll questions to the side here um, and the answers that we received, uh, they're abbreviated. Uh, you can um, uh, see that the healthier school food and beverages had 48% of people felt that that uh, was making a difference uh, in, in terms of obesity, uh, preventing the, the rise in obesity, and, um, uh, but particularly increased public awareness that had 60% uh, response. Uh, neighborhood improvements for safe walking and biking got 30%. 
medical attention, 23%, breastfeeding, 21%, improved school PE and more parks and places to play, each got 17%, and food industry providing healthier choices got 16%. I'm going to ask Amelie to comment on that, but particularly with regard to the things that were left off the list. I think there are some factors um, that we didn't we didn't really endeavor to make that list all comprehensive. It would have been too long. But uh, things like after school fitness, uh, shared use of uh, of school facilities and and uh, like uh, after school opening playgrounds, marketing and media exposure. Um, and then um, access to healthy food by these efforts to to uh, put food markets, full service food markets, in places where there were food deserts previously. All of these have been areas that uh, that many of us have been working on. And Amelie, I, I wonder if you wouldn't care to comment on uh, the results of the polling questions and also the additional uh, the additional interventions that I mentioned as to. Uh, what you've seen either from research or your own experience in terms of uh, where the impact is coming from. Okay. Yes, thank you, George. Uh, you know, actually, the, the healthier foods in schools and the increased public awareness, I, I think that's where most of our efforts have been. Uh, and so that, you know, it's, it's really consistent with what the poll says here. Uh, I think the others show where we need to continue to uh, do more work in these areas so that we can sustain and truly reduce the uh, childhood obesity epidemic. We just don't want to plateau, but it would be, sure it would be nice if we could really um, reduce that by a significant uh, portion. I think one that, that we underestimate is the marketing side of things. Uh, our children tend to to uh, watch over 13 hours of television a day. Everybody asks me, how can they squeeze that in? Well, that's all kinds of media, you know, whether they're on their phones, their computers, or watching TV. Uh, but they're, you know, um, really exposed to um, quite a bit of media. And and then our neighborhoods, you know, there's, there's the billboards, there's the fast foods, restaurants. So our communities are really sur surrounded by some of these issues. And so we really need to be more creative about how we can Im improve access to uh, outdoor facilities through shared use agreements. Um, and then I do hear from a lot of our parents that they're concerned about safety, you know, letting their children out. So again, the and creating better built environments so that it is safe for um, our children to play outside, I think is extremely critical. So we still have a long ways to go, George. We're, we're not done yet. <laughs> okay. So um, thank you again for your presentation. And we want to go to the next and I'm having trouble moving them sorry, so um, that's just all our website information so I encourage you all to, to go to the website so we're going to have another question and this is the next poll um, and please, again, direct your attention to the opportunity to answer this poll question in the lower left hand, right hand column of your, uh, your screen. Uh, the broader interests of the Latino community are best reflected in which of the following statements? The revenue from sugary, sugary beverage companies in the form of wages and donations outweighs the health damage and medical costs from sugary beverages, or the health damage and medical costs from sugary beverages outweighs the revenue and wages and donations from sugary beverages companies. So uh, which of those two statements uh, do you uh, believe better reflect uh, the broader interests of Latino communities? Uh, question answer A or answer B. Think about it for a second, and then we'll go to our uh, uh, way to answer those questions, uh, checking A or B, and then click the Submit button. Our next presenter is Andre Quintero. Uh, Mr. Quintero is mayor of the city of El Monte. Uh, uh, Andre was elected to serve his hometown uh, as mayor of El Monte on November 3rd, 2009, and re-elected in 2011. He previously served two terms on the Board of Trustees of the Rio Hondo Community College District, as mayor, Mr. Quintero currently works for the city attorney of, uh, uh, of Los Angeles 
as a deputy city attorney in the criminal branch as a neighborhood prosecutor for Hollywood Division. Uh, as a graduate, uh, and I'm going to ask the question, Andre, are you in both positions as mayor? You're also working as city attorney for L.A.? So you can answer That's that. correct. Uh, the, like so many... Uh, um, yeah. So many elected officials in these small jurisdictions where uh, you have a part-time city council, uh, you have to have a full-time job, and that's my full-time job. Wow. Well, good for you. So Andre is a graduate of the UC Riverside. He received his bachelor uh, degree in political science and JD and master's in urban planning from UCLA. We're very privileged to have Andre Quintero here. Um, El Monte, is, uh, many of you know, is distinguished for having uh, um, the experience of, uh, of having had a ballot initiative last November that uh, had to do with uh, soda tax, and uh, Latinos played a key role in that vote, and uh, uh, and I'm hoping that Andre is going to be able to give us some information about how that uh, uh, that experience uh, unravel un unfolded in El Monte. Andre. Thank you very much, George. Really appreciate this opportunity to uh, share our experiences uh, in the city of uh, El Monte. Um, you know, it was well known uh, for some time now that we had uh, challenges with obesity in our city. A uh, previous mayor had mentioned it to me at uh, one occasion, uh, how we needed to do more in this area. And as part of that, and I'm going to discuss some of the things that Omani has done, we've adopted kind of a comprehensive approach. And I'm looking forward uh, today to share with all of you uh, some of the insights that we've uh, been able to glean, uh, particularly on issues as, as controversial, or controversial for some people, not so much for me, uh, in terms of trying to find funding sources for providing uh, the, the resources necessary for all the kinds of programs that, that uh, uh, were mentioned earlier and that are going to continue to be mentioned as part of this, uh, this seminar. Um, there's uh, In L.A. County, a prevalence uh, of obesity. Uh, in El Monte, we found that children uh, are 28.3% uh, obese, uh, adults 27.9%. These are some cities in L.A. County uh, that have high rates of obesity. And uh, we found that in El Monte, we have a, a high incidence of obesity, and we needed to do something about that. Uh, risks of overweight and obesity, we all know this. Uh, medical literature provides us uh, this information, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, liver disease, gallbladder disease, respiratory disease, osteoarthritis, and, and also some cancers. So what's happening? Is it a genetic change, less willpower, less informed? These are a lot of the, the same uh, um, questions that were raised uh, by, the, uh, by industry in particular. Uh, that, you know, we just don't have the information or we're just, uh, you know, uh, unwilling to do the right thing and, and take care of ourselves? Or have we built a toxic environment? Uh, that's a, the underlying question that I think uh, a lot of cities have to ask themselves. It's so much, it's so easy to, to, to approve a fast food place in a community like El Monte. Uh, it's a lot harder to approve quality retail. We're also in a food desert in El Monte. So have we made the environment a lot toxic for our residents? And uh, as you can see, junk food is everywhere, and it is. I uh, had a chance to participate in an annual soda summit uh, a year ago and uh, heard from uh, a former person who was employed by uh, a big uh, beverage industry company that did marketing. And their goal is to basically be within arm's reach uh, of uh, of you uh, 24 hours a day if you if they can be if they can have uh, drinks and, and and other types of junk food around you so that you can access it very easily that's their goal. We also have issues related to transportation and and our communities aren't necessarily the most walkable. Uh, I can tell you uh, as a child I really enjoyed uh, riding bicycles around my community but it was not safe. Um, and it continues to not be safe, and this is an issue that we're looking at as well uh, to make our communities more walkable, more rideable, uh, so that we can encourage uh, physical activity. Also, uh, El Monte is one of those cities that uh, would be considered park poor. We don't have enough uh, park space, recreational space, and the park space that we do have isn't really um, 
uh, it doesn't really support different types of that physical activity, uh, whether it's for children, uh, young adults, seniors. You, you, we, we've got to program better for different uh, types of physical activity. Now, are human beings biologically hardwired to crave fat, sugar, and salt? Uh, I, I love this graphic because it, it, it looks just like me. I'm the last one there. Um, and and so there, there's some literature uh, coming out now that's uh, looking at, you know, are we hardwired uh, to crave fat, sugar, and salt? Uh, is it our bodies that are craving this stuff? And now with the uh, accessibility of it, are we just overindulging, which is causing this, this uh, obesity epidemic? The Institute of Medicine and the National Academies uh, provided this. Uh, it's unreasonable to expect that people will change their behavior easily when so many forces in social, cultural, and physical environment conspire against such change. And this is what really what we're up against. Um, if it was easy to be healthy, we would be a nation of healthy people, period, end of story. It is not easy. So we have to figure out uh, different strategies for helping to facilitate uh, more uh, physical uh, activity uh, and, and, and changes in, in, in diets. And that's where public policy comes in. In the city of Almani, we have uh, health and wellness policies. Uh, on March 23, 2010, the city of Almani joined the Heal Cities campaign. And for those of you that are not familiar with that, that's Healthy Eating Living Cities. Uh, on May 3, 2011, Almani City Council approved nutrition standards for city of Almani vending machines, programs, and youth facilities. Um, in terms of the nutrition standards adopted on May 3, 2011, they apply to all vending machines, snack bars, facilities, and youth-oriented programs. It doesn't make any sense for us to be using public resources and have public facilities where recreation is taking place and have vending machines that sell sugary drinks. It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And so uh, a simple uh, change modification to how we do things um, can help send the right messages and, and provide the right uh, support to our families and to their children. Uh, on June 1st, 2011, um, uh, we adopted the Almighty Health and Wellness Element. It's part of our general plan. It's a comprehensive approach to health and wellness for our community. And it includes our parks and rec programs and trying to get more physical activity and other uh, policies I uh, encourage you to go onto our website and take a look at that health and wellness element. That might be something that, as advocates for uh, for healthy policies, uh, that you might be able to um, talk to other cities uh, in your respective communities about adopting. And last year, uh, July 3rd, we adopted a business license fee to go onto the November ballot. Um, we approved it. It was called Measure H. It was a small business license fee on retail outlets that sell, serve, trade, or provide sugar-loaded beverages in the city of Almani. Um, and I, I'm going to discuss that a little uh, more right now. That was a big, big initiative for us. Uh, I was inspired after the um, Soda Summit uh, last year in Washington, D.C., uh, to uh, put this initiative on the ballot. We knew that we needed some additional revenues because, frankly, right now we just don't have the revenues to acquire new park space, to provide programming, uh, whether it's after-school programming, to uh, modify our parks so that they're more uh, recreation-friendly um, and, and uh, physical fitness uh, programs. So we knew that we needed some capital to be able to uh, use uh, for the benefit of our community. Um, in terms of the campaign itself, um, the major lessons that we learned is we lacked capital. We lacked a substantial amount of capital. <laughs> the, the other side, the industry spent at least $1.5 to $2 million uh, in our city alone to defeat this campaign. And to give you some perspective, an average campaign in El Monte for city council is about $50,000 a year, um, or $50,000 in, in an election cycle, and that's a top-notch campaign. They spent close to $2 million against us to defeat this. Uh, we started late. Um, the uh, initiative was adopted, I think, uh, uh, ultimately adopted in August for the November ballot. And we had about 20,000 people that voted in that election. It was a presidential election. So we had a lot more people turning out and very few resources to get a, a consistent and strong message out. They also challenged our ballot language, which uh, initially the ballot language we had, I think, had us at a very good chance of passage, 
when they changed the language and, and no pun intended, watered it down, uh, they they ultimately um, uh, set the measure up to fail, and it, it, it was a very uh, very difficult uh, to get over that 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 change in the language. And we also had to decide whether to make it um, a special tax, which is a two thirds vote. We knew the higher voter threshold might make it more challenging to pass. But what voters consistently said is, if the tax is not devoted to uh, childhood uh, obesity prevention and programs like that, then it's just going to go into the general fund, and we don't support that. So by having a general tax, we would have just needed 50% plus one. By having a special tax, it would have taken two-thirds. The special tax, we could have devoted those resources to a certain thing. So we might have gotten more support uh, for a special uh, tax that was designated for childhood uh, obesity prevention, but we might not have made the two-thirds threshold. And so these were all factors that we were considering as we were trying to put this initiative on the ballot. Uh, the benefits uh, of, of public policy and working in this area, uh, they help spread the word uh, to kids to make uh, healthy choices uh, the easy choice, uh, public dollars for public good, promoting lifelong health habits, serve as role models for children, and message of moderation. And, and one thing that I did notice as we were uh, campaigning last year too, when we're speaking to young people, particularly like soccer clubs and stuff like that, kids get it. They understand. Um, but the messaging out there from the industry is so powerful. Uh, even this, despite the fact that they get it, uh, it's very tempting. And, and our bodies crave the sugar and, and they drink it. Um, I, I like to share this story too. I have a four-year-old daughter. And uh, when we go to, you know, talking about this issue of messaging, um, Around Christmas time, she saw an image, a big billboard image, of Santa Claus drinking a soda, and uh, she she didn't like that. And I said, "Well, why don't you like that?" She's like, "Because Santa doesn't drink soda. Everybody knows Santa drinks milk." So you know, even messaging like that at such a young age is so important. Uh, I shared this conversation with her uh, about uh, sugary drinks. Uh, one time she really wanted and craved uh, some uh, chocolate milk, and she wanted it almost every day. And I had that very candid conversation with her and said, Sarah, too much sugar is not good for you. And then the next time she asked me for water. So um, reinforcing these types of messages, particularly with parents and through public policy, is essential uh, to, to reverse the trends of, of the amount of sugary drinks that we're drinking as a, as a society. Um, California cities uh, that have adopted, other California cities that have adopted nutrition standards include cities of Baldwin Park, South Amani, La Puente, Pico Rivera, Bell Gardens, San Fernando, Carson, Pasadena, Long Beach, Brentwood, Chula Vista, Redding, and Santa Ana. So it's a, it's a movement that's growing, and I'm, I'm hopeful that more cities outside of California and other places are doing similar, um, uh, adopting similar standards. Some additional resources here that you can draw upon uh, for uh, um, policies that, that uh, other municipalities can adopt and, and consider. These are some of the resources. Um, California Center for Public Health Advocacy has some very good information, including the, the Kick the Can campaign is very, uh, uh, has been effective. LA County Public Health has done an exceptional job, particularly the uh, messaging right now they have. Um, there's one particular billboard that they uh, have throughout the county that shows a, a soda uh, bottle being poured into a cup. But instead of the soda being poured into the cup, you see 24 sugar packets to give uh, people perspective of how much sugar they're consuming every time they consume these types of sugary drinks. And also California Project Lean. And, uh, and my poll question, I don't know if this made this on, onto the, uh, the, 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 uh, the polling questions, uh, but I wanted to ask folks, uh, should cities adopt policies to reduce childhood adult obesity? Traditionally, cities are seen as, um, you know, providing police services, fire services, making sure that the streets are maintained and that the public facilities are maintained and, and maybe working on economic development. But there's really um, a, a, a movement out there, particularly from industry, to push back and say, hey, you guys don't need to be in this childhood obesity discussion at all. In fact, just stick to what you do. And, and, and let others worry about this stuff. 
And um, obviously my position, my answer to that is, yes, cities should be adopting policies, comprehensive policies that encourage uh, folks to, to, to be active physically, uh, that encourage, you know, uh, good uh, grocery stores that provide low-cost uh, uh, quality uh, produce and vegetables and information and, and, uh, and, and services uh, that uh, low-income families can afford and uh, so I, I, I definitely am, am a firm believer that cities have a role in this conversation and with that uh, I'll turn it back over to you George thank you very much Thank you, Andre. That's a, a great overview from the perspective of a local uh, policymaker, and uh, we really appreciate that you're, you've taken your time to uh, be with us at this uh, this webinar and give us your perspective. I'd like to draw the audience attention to the fact that Latino policymakers, such as Mr. Quintero, have distinguished themselves in this fight against childhood obesity across the nation and especially here in California. Some of the early state uh, pioneering state legislation here in California was introduced and, and sponsored by Latino policymakers and local policymakers like Mr. Quintero are the ones that are at the forefront. They're right on the, the, the front edge here of this, of this battle that we in California know so well uh, because it resembles a lot of what happened with tobacco control uh, going back 20 years. Our same experience uh, where local communities were confronted with the question as to whether sh cities should step in and create policy around restricting tobacco use in certain places, uh, workplaces and uh, public places, um, in places where people would be um, unwittingly or unknowingly exposed to harmful tobacco smoke and industry pushed back and pushed back and pushed back and made it difficult and caused uh, a, a lot of uh, back and forth. Some cities backed off and some cities went deeper into it. And over time, the uh, uh, number of cities that passed such policies uh, began to mount up and accumulate and created examples of communities that were it uh, took a while to get in favor of it, but got used to the idea, found that they not only appreciated having that kind of policy, but wanted more, and then it mounted up to where there was a, uh, a common interest in having state laws uh, and, and state regulations resemble what localities were doing, and that's how we really mounted up to then a statewide and a nationwide approaches to dealing with, uh, with tobacco and, and reducing tobacco use. And it created a sea change here in California where uh, we reduced tobacco use uh, re and, and over years it's taken years because it takes years to prevent some uh, diseases related to tobacco use like it does with diseases related to uh, uh, sugary soda um, consumption, uh, diabetes and, and heart disease and even cancers. Uh, so, uh, but it's taken years and now we're seeing the, the fruits of that um, in lower lung cancer rates um, and possibly even lower heart disease rates, fewer deaths and um, many, many millions, hundreds of millions of dollars less in medical care costs as a result. So it does bear fruit. I'd like um, for just a second for Andre, if you would uh, draw your attention to the question that we asked. <clears throat> that was a poll question in the lower right hand corner about um, the broader interest of the Latin community being reflected. I think that you addressed most of this in your question about whether the uh, wages and donations from um, sugary beverage companies to say a community like yours outweigh the health damage costs and uh, health damages or whether the health damages and costs outweigh the revenue and wages. You may not have all of that dollar information, and in fact, uh, cities in particular, in Lumpy's case, I believe this is true, may not even control all of the benefits in terms of, of say, medical savings or dollar safe, because the healthcare providers uh, might appreciate that. And if Del Monte is not a healthcare provider, maybe you're not you're not seeing the savings in in uh, the city's pocket, so to speak. But it's still, I think, an important. Um, uh, policy issue for policymakers to weigh. Could you comment on that, please? 
I, I think it it is an important policy issue, even though we don't see necessarily the benefits, um, but we do uh, experience the cumulative effects. Uh, when you have children who are not um, engaged in their studies because of uh, health uh, problems that they're uh, having related to obesity or other issues, we get the cumulative effects. Our goal uh, in Omani is to see more of our children get ahead, go to college, uh, and have very good, healthy, successful lives. But unfortunately, the the, um, the industry is so powerful, and 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 our our folks are are consuming so much of of these drinks that it it has a cumulative effect. So I think that uh, the health health uh, uh, outcomes or the health uh, problems uh, far outweigh any any benefit that we are deriving from these uh, these sugary drinks in terms of revenue. Um, that may be different for other cities. I know there's a neighboring city uh, south of us. City of Downey that has a bottling plant, and I can tell you that they were very active in recruiting other elected officials um, to to go there to visit the bottling plant and to get to hear, if you will, industry's perspective. Uh, there was a union that is involved in the industry uh, that uh, took issue with the fact that I was even considering a tax on sugary drinks because they believed it would have an adverse impact on their employment, and a lot of the people that were employed. Uh, there uh, happen to be minorities. And so, you know, uh, I think the, 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 the larger cumulative impact is far worse than the, the benefits that they'll derive. And frankly, industry is, is also modifying. They're, they're changing uh, the kinds of drinks that they're selling as well because they see this messaging that's going out and, and they don't want to go out of business. Uh, it costs the same to deliver water as it does to deliver sugary drinks. So, you know, um, uh, and, and they make uh, as much if not more on the water. So I think, uh, you know, we, we have to take a look at these types of issues because they do have a cumulative impact on our communities. Great. Well, thank you very much for your uh, participation, your answers, and stick around. We're going to have questions at the end uh, after Mr. Garcia finishes his presentation. We'll take all of the questions that we've received and try to answer as many as we can, so stick with us. Um, okay. our, uh, uh, my screen, again, isn't working to change. My slides here. I want to introduce uh, Robert Garcia uh, next, but uh, before we do that, we're going to go to poll number four, and that's uh, even schools that are struggling financially and or with low test scores should be made to comply with state law to provide physical education to all students. We want to know whether you strongly agree with that statement, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree only or strongly disagree. So please mark your answer in the lower uh, right-hand uh, box of your screen. Uh, A, strongly agree, B, agree, C, neither agree nor disagree, or D, disagree, or E, strongly disagree, uh, and then click the Submit button so that we can uh, tally up the, uh, the answers. Um, and uh, Mr. Garcia will probably uh, address uh, even this question, uh, excuse me, this question in his presentation. Um, he didn't like the question. I'm going to share with you that uh, he has uh, something to teach you about even the content of this question that uh, is not necessarily um, uh, correct. But uh, I think it does get to the spirit of learning, and uh, this is what we're we're about in this uh, webinar is, is to learn what we can. So Robert Garcia is founding director and uh, counsel of the City Project. He's a civil rights attorney who engages, educates, and empowers communities to achieve equal access to public resources. He's founding director and counsel of the City Project, a nonprofit legal and policy advocacy organization based in Los Angeles. He has extensive experience in public policy and legal advocacy, mediation, and litigation involving complex social justice, civil rights, human health, environmental education, and criminal justice matters. Mr. Garcia's work in the past decade has focused on equal access to park, education, and health resources. He is an internationally recognized leader in the urban park movement, bringing the simple joys of playing in parks and school fields to children in communities that are park poor, income poor, and disproportionately of color. 
uh, Robert is a, a great friend to the uh, to the movement for uh, civil justice and civil rights in our uh, our uh, nation and in our communities, and we're privileged to have him here as a presenter. So, Robert, please. Thank you very much, George, and uh, thank you for to PHI and Carmen Nevadas for um, inviting me to be here, and I appreciate being on the same in the same webinar with Amelia and Mayor Quintero of El Monte. As George said, I am a civil rights attorney, and I make no apologies for that. Uh, I am a litigator. I'm a recovering litigator. Um, we, the City Project's mission is equal justice, democracy, and livability for all. And we work with communities uh, in four areas, equal access to, excuse me, quality education, including physical education, equal access to parks and recreation, um, related health disparities from the lack of places for physical activity in parks and schools and communities of color, and local green jobs, related local green jobs. And we do uh, avoid litigation as much as possible, but we also are uh, proud to assert the First Amendment right to access for redress of grievances for people of color um, when other campaign strategies fail. Um, I'm trying to, there's my little arrow for the slides. Um, I started the City Project in 2000. This is our 14th year, um, going into our 14th year. And some of the results that we've achieved are in the education context. We are actively enforcing physical education requirements in public schools. Half the schools audited in California by the California Department of Education do not enforce minutes requirements requiring 20 minutes average in elementary school of physical education and 40 minutes average per day in middle and high school. And I'll come back to that. Um, I also served as the chair of the Los Angeles Unified School District School Bond Oversight Committee, and we raised with the voters of the Los Angeles region $27 billion to build new schools and modernize existing schools. That led to uh, literally billions of dollars in jobs and local business revenue. Um, we've also uh, worked on joint use of schools, pools, and parks. The second major area that we work on is equal access to parks and recreation, and we have helped pass $10 billion in park resource bonds statewide, and those bond measures were passed with the overwhelming support of people of color and low-income people. Without their support, several of those bonds would not have passed, so there are at least two important lessons there. One, uh, the environment is not a luxury, people of color and low-income people will vote to tax themselves to create a better environment. And the second important lesson is those same people need to receive their fair share of the benefits of the park and resource bonds. Uh, so we've helped create or preserve over a thousand acres of parks in communities that are park poor, income poor, and disproportionately of color. And I am a civil rights attorney. Our overarching goal is equal access to public resources for all. We are thrilled that the Institute of Medicine recently published a 400-page report called Educating the Student Body about many of the issues we're talking about. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're talking about here today. The major recommendations of the Institute of, of, of Medicine are, first of all, to le alleviate disparities in physical education and physical activity for students of color and low-income students. Second, in order to do that, it's important to address and improve the whole school environment. It's not just about the schoolhouse. It's about the school field, and it's about the streets and communities surrounding the schools. Um, third, they have cited the social science evidence that physical activity can improve acad academic performance and health. Four, um, they recommend that the federal government make physical education a core subject because so often school districts say, 
the reason we don't provide physical education is we have to concentrate on improving academic test scores, and there's simply not enough time to teach physical ed education as well. And the response to that is physically fit st students tend to do better academically, stay in school longer, and graduate at higher rates. So we agree physical education should be a core subject at the federal level. The Institute of Medicine recommends providing physical education with a minimum of 50% moderate to vigorous physical activity. Uh, the IOM also recommends ongoing teacher training and professional development beginning in college and when, and when students get their teaching degrees. Physical education should be a separate special subject and on an ongoing basis teachers should continue to receive professional development, for example, on the importance of MVPA, moderate to vigorous physical activity. And finally, the Institute of Medicine recommends that parents, schools, public officials, such as the mayor of El Monte, monitor physical education compliance in their local schools. Um, we're very happy with those results from the Institute of Medicine. They echo the results that the city project has achieved over the last 13 years. Um, we persuaded the Los Angeles Unified School District, the second largest in the nation, uh, to comply with physical education and civil rights requirements. Previously, they were not providing the required minutes under California law. And we met with school officials, the school board and the superintendent, and persuaded them that, one, they were violating the education code, and two, they were also violating the civil rights laws. Because if children of color and low-income children don't receive physical education in school, they often don't engage in physical activity. Um, there are no parks in the communities where they live, and the schools tend to be closed after school and on weekends, and the parents are concerned about the student safety. So if they don't get physical education in school, they don't get physical activity. That's why physical education is a civil rights issue. It's an equity issue. It's a health issue. And Dr. Ross, of the, California, the head of the California Endowment, has called the work with the Los Angeles Unified School District a best practice example for districts across the state to provide a quality education for the children of California. We're grateful to the endowment for funding some of this work and to George for funding some of this work. We have published the uh, summary of how we did this in the Journal of Public Health Policy. More recently, we published with Sarah Samuels and Associates a report on monitoring compliance in, the, in Los Angeles schools in the Annals of Behavioral Medicine. And we're very happy with those journal articles. Um, but ultimately, um, we don't. Uh, judge the success of the city project based on the number of articles published or the number of policies adopted. Um, the way we judge success is whether is is by the number of smiles on children who did not otherwise have physical education in school, or by the smiles on children playing in parks that did not exist before. So we 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 do work with agencies when we can outside of court but we also use legal strategies to address childhood obesity and the disparities in, in public health. Um, these strategies basically rely on the lessons of the civil rights movement, uh, including equal justice laws which guarantee equal access to public resources. They prohibit intentional discrimination, and very importantly, they prohibit unjustified discriminatory impacts. These laws include Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and its regulations, the President's Order 12898 on environmental and health justice, and parallel state laws such as California's Government Code 11135. And I'll illustrate what I mean by those laws in a moment. Again, coming back to the strategies that the City Project uses, uh, first of all, we engage in community organizing and coalition building, including working with non-traditional partners. Second, 
we translate research into policy law and systemic change and real, real change in people's lives. Third, we engage in strategic media campaigns. Four, we engage in policy and legal advocacy outside the courts. And five, when necessary, we also seek access to justice through the courts. Um, one example is the following, um, and this is relevant to the point that Mayor Quintero made earlier about El Monte being park poor. We analyzed nine counties of Southern California, including Los Angeles County, and we see similar patterns throughout Southern California. In Los Angeles County, for example, children of color living in poverty with no access to a car have the worst access to parks. They have the worst access to schools with five acres or more of playing fields. They have the highest levels of childhood obesity, and they suffer disproportionately from being at risk to gangs, crime, drugs, and violence. Uh, we've documented those findings in a report. I'll come back to that in a moment. But as civil rights attorneys, when we see disparities like that in the, on the map that you see there, the red hot spots are where those children of color living in poverty with no access to a car and no parks and no school fields, that's where they live. The green space is um, the park space. And as you can see, the people surrounding the green space tend to be disproportionately white and wealthy. And the places where there are no parks, that's where low-income people of color live. So we ask ourselves, why is that? And part of the reason cause for these numeric disparities is the history of discrimination in Los Angeles. Um, discrimination in housing throughout much of the 20th century. People of color could not live wherever they wanted to live. They could only live where racially restricted housing covenants allowed them to live. Um, federal government subsidized mortgages only in racially homogenous neighborhoods. Um, many economic programs, including Social Security and other New, New Deal programs, were not available to people of color. Um, you see the continuing legacy of that today and that the wealth levels for people of color are far lower than for non-Hispanic whites. The photograph there is a historic photograph, I believe, from the 1940s um, in Los Angeles. Uh, it was open. It was explicit. Uh, it was effective. Um, that is why you see the continuing legacy of discrimination in the, mo in the map of green access for Los Angeles County. And people sometimes ask, why do you have to raise historical issues like this? Well, there's a, there's a black man in the White House. Um, the civil rights era is over. Um, history is history. This is so confrontational. This is playing the race card. Um, and our response is that the United States Supreme Court has held that today, the way you prove intentional discrimination, one of the ways you prove intentional discrimination is to document the history of discrimination because the U.S. Supreme Court recognizes that you're not going to find signs like this today, that you do find numerical disparities like are illustrated in this map. So as a matter of complying with U.S. Supreme Court precedents, and building the best case we can in court and in the court of public opinion, we research, we research the history of discrimination, and this discrimination is, is simply part of life in Los Angeles. As I said earlier, um, we have helped raise $27 billion for public schools in Los Angeles, for the Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, in, two, in 1999, um, Los Angeles had not built a new high school in over 30 years. Since then, I believe there's been five local bond measures, including um, this ballot in 2002. The, lo the voters of LA voted to tax themselves, and together with their local bond measures and matching federal and state dollars, um, we have $27 billion now for school construction and modernization. LA has built over 130 new schools in the past 10 years. 
and there's still seven billion dollars left for for more work. Um, that's led to the creation of schools, new schools like this, as centers of, the, of their community. Um, we worked hard to make sure those schools were prioritized in the most underserved communities. We also worked on the joint use of schools, pools, and parks. This site on the slide now is what is now Los Angeles State Historic Park. In, this is the flagship project of the city project. In 2000, um, the city of Los Angeles wanted to put 32 acres of warehouses in the last vast open space in downtown LA without any environmental review uh, and without considering the park alternative or the impact on people of color. And to his credit, Secretary Andrew Cuomo, who was Secretary of HUD at the time, Housing and Urban Development, in response to our administrative complaint, not litigation, but an administrative complaint, wrote a letter to the city of LA saying he would not issue a penny of federal subsidies for the warehouse proposal unless there was a full environmental study that considered the park alternative and considered the impact on people of color. Um, because the federal subsidies were gone, the deal did not pencil out for the developer, and we entered into uh, settlement discussions with the developer and ultimately reached an agreement that if we could persuade the state to buy the land for a park, the developer would walk away from the warehouse proposal. And if we could not do that in that budget year, we would abandon our, our opposition to the warehouses. Um, we were able to persuade the state to do that. Today, that is Los Angeles State Historic Park. The New York, uh, excuse me, the Los Angeles Times called the Cornfield Victory a heroic monument and a symbol of hope. Uh, it's an example of how we applied the civil rights laws, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act and its regulations to prohibit intentional discrimination and dis discriminatory impacts. We argued you would not put 32 acres of warehouses in Beverly Hills without an environmental impact report. The people of Beverly Hills are doctors, lawyers. They can afford to hire their own attorneys. If anyone even thought of it, they would be in court in a minute. If you don't do it in Beverly Hills, you better not do it in downtown L.A. We filed the administrative complaint with Secretary HUD, with the Secretary of HUD. We also filed a lawsuit in state court under state environmental laws. Uh, and that lawsuit was dismissed when we reached the agreement to create the park there. Um, those children running in downtown LA are from the adjoining Cathedral High School. That is an example of the joint use of a park and a school at a site that was formerly an abandoned rail yard for 10 years in downtown LA. We are very um, happy that the national government is catapulting the work we've done with our community allies and others in LA, catapulting green justice and health to the national level. For example, the National Park Service published a study called Healthy Parks, Healthy People US uh, in 2011 explicitly saying that there are disparities in access to parks and recreation based on race, color, and national origin, that these disparities contribute to obesity and other health problems, and that park agencies have an obligation to do something about these disparities. <clears throat> Most recently, the National Park Service has released a study for a national recreation area, a new national recreation area, in the San Gabriel Mountains and Watershed. Um, Mayor Quintero, we ask that you introduce a resolution in the city of El Monte to support that national recreation area. Again, the National Park Service recognized that LA is park poor and that there are unfair disparities in access to parks and recreation that contributes to the disparities in health and recommending the national recreation area, drawing in part on the work of the city project and our allies. Congresswoman Judy Chu is now um, working uh, through hearings, public hearings, as well as drafting legislation in Congress to create that national recreation area. And our, on her website, she has frequently asked questions about the San Gabriel Mountains National Recreation Area. And one of the major three reasons she gives for why a public, for why a recreation area is necessary there is public health and environmental justice. 
Um, we've been working on these issues for 13 years. These are among the first times public officials and park agencies have explicitly said and acknowledged that parks are a civil rights issue and they will fix the problems. Um, as I mentioned, we've published the policy report for nine counties of Southern California documenting these disparities, but also proposing recommendations. Um, the study is Healthy Park Schools and Communities. It is community-based partic participatory research. We worked with about 50 community grassroots groups as well as experts, demographers, health professionals, funded in part by the endowment and uh, funded in part by the Kresge Foundation. It is available on our website. If you go to our website, you can click on Map Justice and you will have access to the overall report for nine counties and to individual reports for six of those counties. Finally, I'd like to, I'm running out of time. Um, from our perspective, this is about healthy Latino communities, this webinar. Uh, health is not just the prevention of obesity, as important as that is. Uh, we rely on the WHO definition of health, World Health Organization of Health, which is a complete absence of disease. Uh, just last week, we filed on behalf of three generations of Latino children in Oxnard, California, a lawsuit against the Environmental Protection Agency for EPA's failure to protect three generations of children over toxic pesticides at the public schools that they attend. And the community of Oxnard is disproportionately Latino. It is in the worst 10% of the areas in the state of California in terms of toxic pollution. And it also has among the highest levels of obesity and overweight and lack of physically fit students. Um, so the issues are the same. Um, distribute the benefits of public resources equally and distribute the burdens equally. Um, we're pushing the envelope of environmental justice and health justice by focusing on the benefits, clean schools, parks, that we are relying on the lessons of the civil rights movement and the equal justice laws. So in response to the question that George posed, which he said, I disagree with, I do. For the following reasons, the question is, if a school district is financially disadvantaged and has poor test scores, should it be required to comply with the law? And we say the answer is yes for the following reasons. First of all, the legislature has spoken. Physical education is required. Second, the courts have spoken. The California Court of Appeal has held a school district can be sued for failure to provide physical education. Third, the people have spoken. Uh, a field poll by the endowment shows that close to 100% of those surveyed believe physical education in public schools is necessary, and about 75% believe it is worth it to pay more money to provide physical education because of the benefits. So we don't ask should bank robbers who are financially troubled and who did not do well in school be prosecuted for robbing banks? And we shouldn't ask, should financially troubled school districts balance the budget on the health of our children? Um, we can raise the money. We have, as evidenced by the propositions that voters have passed. We can continue to do so. The second part of George's question, even if the schools are doing poor academically. As I said earlier, physically fit students do better academically. So it is no answer to say we can't provide physical education because we have to concentrate on test scores. The Institute of Medicine documents time spent in physical education is time well spent to improve, at, improve academics. Um, I am out of time. Uh, the values at stake that we work on include human health and development, economic vitality, conservation values, culture, culture, heritage, and spirituality. But ultimately, the values at stake um, are expressed in our mission, equal justice, democracy, and livability for all. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Robert, for a very uh, inspirational uh, presentation and uh, really quite a reminder about the basis for uh, civil justice behind a lot of the work that we're doing here with obesity prevention. Um, I'd like to then now move to the questions that were posed by our, uh, our uh, participants here. Um, and I'm going to take one that is asking, uh, policy changes are good to see and would like to know more about legislative policy advocacy that school boards, wellness policy, safe routes to school, built environment, capacity building. Um, I'm going to refer this question to, uh, to the website of uh, Change Lab Solutions. Uh, the M plan has a lot of policy information about different sources as well as uh, prevention institutes. So changelabsolutions.org and preventioninstitute.org are two good resources for uh, these kinds of policy uh, uh, documents and, and examples. Um, I'd like to know if anybody else on the call, possibly Emily, uh, if you have any other references you would like to refer these people to about uh, policy, uh, more depth about the policy um, uh, involved. Uh, this is Amelie. Uh, we do, if you go to saludamerica.com, uh, you know, .org rather, we, we have a lot of things that we're going to be putting on. We'll have more come uh, available, you know, in, in January when we launch our platform. But we do have uh, some resources listed as, after each of our research briefs. Um, Amelie, stay on and to answer this question. Has there been any research done on the dose of intervention needed to see change in the community? Oh, that's an excellent question, George. I am not aware of anything. Uh, you know, I'm, I've just been reviewing some literature, like on you know trying to reduce consumption of sugary drinks and things like that. And I know California has been really progressive in that area. Uh, but again, the dosage is extremely important. You know, just as you know, like our five-a-day campaign, nine-a-day campaign, trying to get people to eat more fruits and vegetables. It's something that remains consistent. And I, that's my concern many times in our public health messages. You know, we do it for a brief point of time, and then we, we taper off, and some, th these behaviors are difficult to change, and we really need to keep that intensity up. But I, I don't have a dose response um, resp response for you. <laughs> so um, another question is about um, methods and disciplines utilizing, uh, being utilized to create cultural competency. I know that was done in uh, some of the food programs, even here in California, at the, the restaurants with uh, with meal uh, planning uh, and, and calorie content. Any other uh, comment about cultural competency? Uh, yeah, we, we have, uh, here in San Antonio, we have something called the, the uh, Culinary Institutes of the America, and they have, they're specializing in Latin flavors. Uh, and they recently had a healthy schools, um, healthy eating program, uh, and, they've, and they bring in all the um, school chefs uh, to, you know, uh, entice them to how to utilize some of these new um, uh, ingredients like quinoa that's higher in protein and things like that, but giving it um, a Spanish or Mexican flavor or, you know, more Latin flavor. Uh, and so that it, it's meeting with lots of success. So I encourage people to kind of go to their website and see some of those recipes. Um, because it is, you know, um, when we're trying to get offering brown rice like through the WIC program, but if people don't know how to cook brown rice and make it as just as tasty as the white rice, Mexican rice, it's it's tough, you know. So that we also have to have these educational, um, so that the foods can be used appropriately and, and taste good, because that's part of our culture is that we really like food that tastes good. Robert, could you uh, give us some examples of how low-resource communities have succeeded in creating more opportunities for physical activity uh, in light of challenges like lack of money and competing needs? Uh, maybe, you know, soccer teams, huh? Um, well, one of our long-standing allies and clients is the Anahuac Youth Soccer Association in Northeast Los Angeles, which is disproportionately Latino and uh, low-income and park poor. And Raul Macias started that organization around 1998 with, with enough children to fill a soccer team, which is about 14 or 15 children. And today they have 3,000 children and their families and friends. And Raul does not charge the families for participation on the soccer teams, for uniforms, for referees, for field space. Um, 
because he recognizes that they can't afford that. And so we worked we work arm in arm with them. They were plaintiffs in a lawsuit to create what is now Rio de los Angeles State Park at Taylor Yard, a 40-acre park that's led to the revitalization of the Los Angeles River. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is expected to release a, a report on the greening of the LA River over the next 20 years, um, including serving communities of color, low-income communities, park poor communities. Um, so there is an example, and we work closely with Raul and the coaches and the parents and the students when it comes time, for example, to testify at a city council hearing on why they should have a park or why they should have physical education. We prepare talking points for them in English and Spanish. Uh, we meet with them in advance. Um, we help them organize uh, the democratic participation that they are learning as as children and as immigrant families. Indeed, there's a book, Harvest of Empire, um, that talks about the fact that new Latino immigrants in the U.S. do not organize politically. They first organize soccer leagues. And using the same human and organizing skills they learn in doing soccer games and coaches' meetings and so on, they then go on to organize politically. And we've seen exactly that happen with Raul Macias, who's now on the local neighborhood council, and with the children of Anahuac. Great, thanks. Um, Andre, how about our Mayor Quintero? Could you answer um, how to engage local county governments in uh, obesity prevention activities like uh, Let's Move or Heal Cities? Because uh, we have a, a participant that's talking, uh, saying they're from a conservative area and there's hesitancy to sign up in these campaigns uh, because they might be considered partisan. How do you deal with that partisanship? Hi, George. This is Star. Unfortunately, um, I noticed that Andre wasn't on the telephone any longer. And, oh. Um, I'm not sure he'll he'll be able to join us on the telephone again. Then I'm going to just briefly uh, uh, cite uh, examples that we've had in our own uh, in our own state in the Central uh, California. There are a number of very conservative areas, and people do have challenges just like these where. Uh, um, there is disagreement that uh, that there can be activities that would promote uh, wellness or health, uh, um, even even in schools or uh, up to the degree of parks. Uh, people feel that government does not have a role in uh, in personal behavior, um, and and so it does pose a challenge. But in all, we've seen Latino communities be able to band together people with a common interest and go ahead and and uh, in one community create their own mocking club without regard to what the uh, maybe the local paper or even the local uh, uh, elected officials are saying, uh, but these mocking groups or parent groups or efforts can continue to go forward and they attract attention and uh, build momentum, they do good things and um, have even managed to, to have some changes uh, done after agreements and negotiation and showing that there's a strong community and civic spirit and the will of the people, uh, and uh, basically a plebiscite or a majority of people that come forward and show how uh, the interest is in better community, uh, and uh, and they've gotten changes made. So it's a matter of, of uh, creating a movement or, or getting many people to stand with you and then showing your presence and showing how powerful that, that presence is and, uh, and, and swaying uh, opinion in your favor. Uh, and there again, there, there are groups out there and networks that are able and willing to help you and be role models, mentors, and provide you with uh, with examples. And uh, I'm sure Salute America uh, or uh, InPlan and uh, Prevention Institute and um, California, uh, Central California Regional Obesity Prevention Program, PCROPP.org, uh, those will all be good resources for you. Um, and the last question that I'm going to ask, because it's uh, almost the end of our time, is uh, are LAUSD schools well-funded to be able to respond to this mandate for physical education? And uh, it uh, says uh, uh, LAUSD parents have had to fundraise for PE and the teacher's salary. Um, this is Robert. Uh, first of all, all schools in California are underfunded compared to the golden era of public education in California in the 1960s. Second, um, even within LAUSD, uh, there are schools that 
before were providing physical education within existing budgets. And now um, LAUSD as a, as a policy and legal matter is, is providing physical education. So we think the, the claim that schools don't have the money to provide physical education is simply a bureaucratic excuse for not doing it. I think more importantly, nobody's holding um, school districts feet to the fire uh, and, and telling them the law says you have to provide physical education. The courts say you have to provide physical education. There are 1,000 school districts in California. We've extended the lessons of LAUSD to four other school districts, including El Monte. Um, if half of them aren't enforcing PE requirements, that's 500 school districts left to go. Um, we could do more and faster with, uh, with more funding. But again, the people we represent are unpopular people in unpopular causes. That's the bigger issue, is that nobody takes their rights seriously, not that there's not enough money to, take their, to enforce their rights. Thank you, Robert. I want to thank all of our presenters, uh, Dr. Amelia Ramirez, Mr. Andre Quintero, Mayor Quintero, and Robert Garcia for their presentations. We really appreciate that you've stick, stuck with us through this uh, uh, my webinar and thank our co-sponsors, including the Latino Coalition for Healthy California, Kaiser Permanente, California Endowment, uh, and the Public Health Institute, and to the Dialogue for Health staff, Star Tiffany and Joanna Hathaway. Um, please. Uh, um, uh, Star, would you wish to make a closing comment? Hi, George. Thank you. I just wanted to let everybody know that um, the recording and slides will be uh, posted on our website, and I sent out that link a couple of times. So please check back there in a couple of days when we've had a chance to post them. And we'd just like to thank you so much for participating in this web forum and also uh, like to thank Dr. Flores for moderating, uh, Mr. Garcia for joining us, Mr. Quintero, and Dr. Ramirez. Thank you so much for your presentations and uh, for your time.